Hey everybody, it's the Trout, and welcome to another episode of the Trout Show. Thank you so much for stopping by. You know, I used to be an avid watcher of Monty Python, and they used to say things like, and now for something completely different. Well, that's what today's show is. It's completely different from all the genres of music I've ever interviewed before, bands. I've interviewed rock musicians, blues musicians, pop musicians, country music, all sorts of different genres. But today we take a listen to one of the great brass bands. That's right, Complete Brass. They're called King Cabbage Brass Band, and they're out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. They've set themselves on fire by playing in all the, a lot of great places, but their music is fun to listen to, and every place they go, they are exciting to watch, and people love getting up and dancing to the music. But they're not like everybody else I've talked to. There isn't no guitars, there's no big amplifiers. It's just guys and gals doing their thing, blowing some instruments, and blowing some great tunes. It's the brainchild of a wonderfully talented musician out of Tulsa. His name is Greg Fallis. So sit back. Enjoy this episode where you get to learn all the history of a wonderfully talented band called King Cabbage Brass Band out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's next on The Trout Show. Just a handful of years ago is that you guys started this, you put it together, I guess, the King mm -hmm. Cabbage Band. Was it just like 2021 or something? How long has it been together? Yeah, King Cabbage Brass Band. Uh, we started June of 2021. Our first show was actually quite large. It was for um, hundreds of people at an international bike race that's held. It's kind of like the the redneck Mardi Gras of Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, Crybaby Hill. And um, so, yeah, I moved back from New Orleans in May of 2021. And uh, we had two rehearsals together and then we played that show in June. So uh, we just, yeah, we just celebrated three years um, with King Cabbage and it's, it's been a good three years. So did you have all these people that you knew that you'd performed with, or you just had because of friends and people like that, you could go out and say, Hey, I need a sax player. I need a trumpet player. I need somebody to do a percussion. Did you have access to all those people? Yeah, I mean, these are folks that I've known for a long time, went to college with, played in bands with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they've uh, they've kind of been with me, been friends um, through a lot of uh, different changes in hair and fashion and all manner. <laughs> and I've seen me at some at my high highs and my low lows. So there are people I trust and. Um, and yeah, we've we've got a lot of combined um, experience and chemistry together. So I think that adds to uh, to what the ceiling of the group could be for sure. Well, the thing I've learned is I'm 10 minutes away from University of North Texas, which has got the phenomenal jazz band and all that stuff going on. And I, I was up there earlier yeah. this year. I have a friend of mine said professor up there. And I went up a year or so ago. They asked me to come to a rehearsal. And, you know, I'm a rock blues guy and you're like, but I, I love the horn stuff because I appreciate the quality of the music that you do. Uh, but once I got there, I actually went up, this is kind of a side coming. I went, she asked me to come up and see Lyle Lovett, to hang out and to see him for that event. Yeah. And all these people that know each other, Lyle was talking about, oh, hey, so-and-so, and they were all horn players. You know, or they, yeah. Were, yeah, and it was like, oh, yeah, he and he toured, and then he was standing there, and I was talking to another performer, I brought a friend of mine, another musician friend with me, and he goes, oh, yeah, and he, he knew a guy that we knew that played with us, and I mean, it's just one of those things, so I guess what my point being is, once you get that quality of music, you know, and you guys understand, because you've all been to school, and you all, you're all degreed, or whatever, you all, you understand in other words, you're not sitting around and learning stuff by ear. You know, your music is, you've got sure. ch charts and everything. Where a guy like yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, sure. No, I mean, yeah. Um, I think that the history of this music is very much by ear and, and probably shares a lot of similarities to, to rock and blues um, more than <clears throat> even like what you would... Um, you know, experience sitting in the one o'clock band at UNT. Um, our trombonist, Isaac Washam, actually played lead trombone in the one o'clock band <laughs> there you at go. UNT. 
and he's he is a uh he is what i would refer to as a freak of nature like he's he's incredible um it, it, definitely the the most talented um trombonist i've ever had the pleasure of uh standing next to um so i would encourage everyone to come to the show sunday uh june 7th just to see him uh but but yeah i mean <clears throat> i think there's a you know we come from different backgrounds um like isaac comes from a a uh classical uh trombone quartet and trombone soloist background um and then you know um i guess most of us went to school but we do arrange a lot uh myself and the saxophonist andy mccormick and the drummer nicholas foster we all pitch in arrangements um and then we tend to uh read off tablets for the first bit until we have them memorized and then we'll go um without music well so you and i was i was watching some of your clips um do you chris you guys are kind of all over the place which i kind of like that because it was like you're doing this and then i'll say definitely yes and you're kind of like yeah doing that and and so how as a band leader myself who comes up with the idea that let's do pearl jam or let's do uh i know you played in the glenn miller orchestra for years for a long of a while for a while to mm -hmm. them and so somebody says, hey, let's do Pearl Jam. I know oh, I'd rather do In the Mood or something. Like, so how do you, do you collectively do that? I mean, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think just anything that feels genuine, uh, we want to do. So like anything that comes from a place of, like I used to listen to the song with my dad or, you know, my my grandpa used to love this song or um, this is what I listened to when I was in, high school we used to rock out to in high school yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. anything that feels like like a genuine uh choice um we want to do so that's kind of i guess it, with the common thread being you know we're a brass band and whatever we want to whenever we arrange we want to kind of brass bandify it so if we can take all that stuff and distill it down uh into the style that we um so much enjoy which is new orleans brass band yeah. uh style then we, you know, we'll try to do that as best we can as a bunch of, you know, white dudes from Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, <laughs> but. But, you know, there's but, not yeah. much difference between what I do and what you do. So if you're watching you perform your band and all the guys up there and the, you still have a lady, I guess, don't you have one woman in the band? or do you still, Kristen, you have, yeah. 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 So the guys and gal, um, it's basically mm -hmm. the same thing. There's a song, there's somebody that's going to take lead on part of it. You know, in my my world, so to speak, it's somebody singing. You guys are playing instead of singing, but then somebody breaks out and goes, "Hey, I'm going to take a lead part." You know, as a lead guitar player, I'm the one that's doing that. You're the same way. Hey, give it to the sax player to do. You know, give me twelve bars on a sax lead. But mm -hmm. I guess the question is then, what do you do then? Because you got to be have smarts to do this. Who arranges? I mean, you just said all three. There are three of you to get together. You say, "Oh, I want to do this tune," and the band goes, "Okay, that sounds good." Do you sit down and go, "Let's let's arrange this"? Who, who kind of does that? No. Um, yeah, very rarely are we arranging stuff as a group. We'll bring in arrangements as drafts and then workshop them together. Okay. Um, say, hey, I think this could happen here. I think this could this form could change here. And then whoever the arranger is for that song will go back and like edit the chart or, you know, kind of use those notes to um modify it. But uh like I said that earlier, that our drummer um and saxophonists are the other two arrangers i arrange a lot myself as well um so <clears throat> usually it's us three that are writing originals or arrangements um our bassist you know will give him um things to look at but he pretty much writes his own parts too so i guess in a sense he's sort of writing his own parts because he's yeah. like you know hey i, I got a, I wrote a baseline for you i wrote a chair and oh, no, i don't need that uh which is fair when you've been studying bass lines your entire life you don't uh, need it yeah. You don't need a trombone player to tell you what to play. And, and that's fair. Um, but yeah, it is, it is us three. And I think it's unique. Our drummer, you know, um, is a very talented arranger and composer of musical mind. And uh, he has brought a lot into the band, a, a significant amount of what we play. Um, and some of our best music is from him. 
it's interesting to me because the fact, well, I was going to ask you this. It's, when you started this, you put your first gig together, and I saw a little bit about that. You guys put it together, and then like three days later, you're out performing. Now that you've done it for a while, do you see a standard? And I know you try, obviously change the, you know, whatever play, you, whatever list you change, your playlist probably changes. Have you found a standard couple of tunes or three or four tunes that people go, oh, yeah, we know no matter where we play that, people <laughs> get up for it? Yeah. So you course. already, you've discovered that, right? So that's all part of the, the you know, repertoire is to, to just go, okay, we know when we play this song, everybody's going to get on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think every band has those songs. Um, but yeah, for us, it's, it's probably the Beyonce we play crazy in love. Like as, as soon as that, that crazy in love, uh, line comes in, people, you know, people go nuts. And then, um, the rage against the machine that we play, people usually lose their minds. <laughs> That's a pretty sure thing. We don't really play that song a ton anymore. Um, but uh it's got to kind of be in the right place at the right time just because it's sure it shut it shuts a, like a visceral um raw thing that just to play it all the time kind of devalues it in a sense um but those two primarily the, the beyonce song i feel like pretty much anywhere in the set uh we could throw that in and people would just be like oh <laughs> just kind of go crazy and lose their mind <laughs> so yeah when you when you started this and put it together, were people thinking like you're crazy? I mean, in other words, you're 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 doing something unique, but you're also attracting a different crowd. I mean, I you know if you watch some of your videos and some of that stuff, it's not like you think of. We were I was in Glenn Miller. You go play Glenn Miller. Most of the people in the crowd are going to be older. You know, I would assume a lot of them because they like you know in the middle totally. and all this that kind of music. But when I saw the crowd that you're performing, of course, I'm sure it's where your the gigs are too. It makes a difference. You're not seeing, you know, 80 year old people in there, and you're not seeing, you know, yearly young people. So you're attracting a different group, to me, because how many people are exposed to brass band music? You know, it's not something you hear mm -hmm. on the radio. It's not something you know. So it, to me, it was like, okay, when you started this up, people said, "You guys are nuts. Go ahead, try it." Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you then you start booking gigs, and then you're like, oh, I think people like this. Why, mm -hmm. do, you, why do you think they do? Well, I mean, obviously you guys are good what you do, but why do you think people want to come to your show? Why, what's, what do you think the driving force is that why people like what you guys do? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, um, the band is really talented. Uh, the musicians we have in their their own respect are are very talented individuals, and I think the chemistry we have on stage is is uh, is really good. I think I think chemistry, um, I think I think chemistry brings a lot of joy to the show, and the, yeah. that joy kind of bleeds into the audience. Um, so yeah, I mean. It, those are kind of the intangible factors um, for why we could be successful or at bringing, um, I don't know, d maybe different crowds out to shows. Um, obviously, playing dance music makes people want to dance, yeah. um, and it's been it's been a cool experience to like you know play the Beyonce and then also be like at at, at a bar by. OU in Norman, Oklahoma, and then we play I'll Fly Away, which is a hymn, and people just like start twerking, you know, so like I'll Fly Away at one in the morning, and it's like, oh, hell yeah, like this is, this works too, like just something about the spirit of the brass band, you know, that's, that's not something that was like a really a risk, you know, I mean, I've seen people get down to brass bands for years, and so we're just trying to kind of continue that uh, tradition up in Oklahoma, you know? So I'm just glad that people in Oklahoma enjoy it, but I think you could pretty much take it anywhere and people would enjoy it. I, I don't disagree with you. And, and here's, here's, <clears throat> and you've already thought this out. 
you've got a problem because now if you, you go, okay, I could go to Roanoke, Virginia. I could go to Denver. I could go to Seattle. I could take this anywhere. And all of a sudden, you, you're, you're not just a brass band out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're a touring band that mm-hmm. has how many members are in the band i'm probably i'm sure it fluctuates a little bit but how many do you typically have yeah seven or eight seven or eight so then you're going like mm-hmm. wow okay uh they're gonna pay us how much <laughs> you know right it's, it's, then it turns into a real business so to speak mm-hmm. and it looks like to me that you're already on the way because i looked at your touring dates i mean obviously they're regional in, in respect i mean obviously you're not going to go from austin to you know, Miami, you know, or something right. like that. So now it's kind of a business. Do, mm-hmm. do the people, I'm just curious, do the people have day jobs? And this is a, something that, that, you know, they do or they do, is this it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's like half and half. Some people have day jobs. Um, so, yeah, we, we want to make sure that, um, yeah, we want to make sure that the the gigs we play make sense for everyone. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of and yeah, I don't know. I guess it it does make it does make touring full time a challenge when you have so many members, um, and that's not something that's off the table for us. I think um, in the future that's definitely a possibility. Um, I just want to be patient with it. Um, yeah. and maybe I'm being too patient, but, um, you know, we get, you know, leads from all over the, the country, mostly the Midwest region and the, sure. and Texas. Uh, um, so just kind of seizing those opportunities, uh, when we get anchor dates, as I refer to them, uh, to book runs around, mm-hmm. just making sure that, uh, we're on it and, um, so far, you know, uh, we've had the van about six months now and it's holding up great, uh, <laughs> through, through trips to, uh, San Antonio and Houston area. And where did uh, you, where did you play in San Antonio? Do you remember? We played at Sam's, Sam's burger joint. Oh, okay. And then we played at, um, we played at the Zulu, uh, association, a taste of new Orleans, which is a big event they do at the, uh, at the ri- at the river garden i think it is yeah um it's it was really cool um so yeah those two places and then we're going to be at continental club july 6th this coming saturday in austin yeah and then you play yeah. here the next day yes did you did you in your mind have an idea that this could potentially blow up to something really big um sure i like you know i like i said i'm i none of the work uh in day to day grind is lost on me i mean it's um i guess for some for some people um things blow up differently um you know there's there's people who go viral and skyrocket to the top i think for us it's um you know, we want to build this thing out regionally, mm-hmm. um, build up our annual calendar with repeat work with satisfied clients, you know, whatever. Um, so that when we book these series, these concert series in different towns, they ask us to come back. Um, I look That's at, cool. I look, yeah. yeah, man, I look at, at it more of a, a build than a blow up. Um, just because I think that's what you have to do. Um, at least for me, that's, that's what I have to do. So, yeah. Well, because once, once you go from, and, and I want to go back to what you said earlier, it is when you're having a good time up there, everybody has a good time. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, you can see it, you know, of course I'm a musician. I can see when people are like, Oh yeah, they're having, yeah, that's just fine. Instead of like, we're coming out and playing another gig mm-hmm. that, that does tend to lend itself, but your music also lends to yourself to being upbeat music you know you're not going to go into uh, you take i'll fly away that's fun to me but you're not you're not <laughs> going to play some slow blues number that goes on for 10 minutes and people bring them down you're going to it's always going to be kind of upbeat kind of music have you guys done any recording yet 
yeah um yeah we we um we have some music out there uh for streaming and then we have um some more some original music some more original music uh that we recorded at the church studio which is leon russell's mm. um studio that he founded which is now owned by Teresa knox um that's it where's that she, new orleans is that new orleans that's in that's in tulsa oh in tulsa oh, uh, okay. that's right he was yeah. from was he from tulsa that's right yeah i didn't know that uh, it's yeah. it's actually just down the street from me here um but we recorded there um and we're mixing uh this month and yeah i'm excited to get that that new music out i think it, it sounds um uh, very good quality and um it, it, like I said, it's it's all original, so I'm excited to get that that out, and hopefully that will um, you know help uh, propel some of our growth um, going into next year. Well, you're a little bit different than most people that I talk to. Is they do music and then go out and support the music, you know, a lot. So because mm -hmm. there's, as you know, there's no money selling albums anymore, and right. you, you could get a billion streams, and I still not make much money. So they would did recording and then people may or may have heard may or may have heard the music, the new music, but they, obviously the right. music, it's already been on there for years. And then they go on tour to support it. You guys are kind of in the other way around because your music, a lot of it's known obviously because you're playing, I hate to say covers, but your own version of, what did you say? Brassify it. Is that the word you use? Brassify? Yeah, we have a lot of original music we play in our set. Um, and then we have original music on uh, Spotify as well. But but then, yeah, I mean, about a half of our set is probably recognizable because we, cool. brass, band we brass bandify certain <laughs> covers. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, look, man, I plead guilty to uh, playing covers. We well, can We can put that hat on if we need to. There's well, but what you're doing in the instruments that you play, that's almost cover related. You know, in other words, when I play in a band that, you know, I do originals, I write originals too, but but at the end of the day, people go, Can you play? And this is off the subject, but it was really funny. My last band we had, my singer was into Prince. He loved Prince. Mm -hmm. And I said, Well, okay, what do you want to play? He says, I want to do Purple Rain. I go, really? And I'm a lead guitar player, so I have to learn all the parts for the lead guitar player. And I went, okay, we'll try it. Well, the result was every time we played, everybody was singing along. Right. They were all, right. Rrr, rrr, rrr. and I go, okay, now I know why you like it. I mean, he liked the tune, but that's kind of what your music's like. You know, as soon as you mm -hmm. start playing something, they don't, they can't sing and may not have words to it, but they know it. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you're doing, you know, and then the opportunities, I, which is another thing too. You can, I think, and this is my opinion, whereas bands I've talked to before, they do only originals. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get going with that stuff, especially mm -hmm. in the music industry. Mm -hmm. You guys can do what you're doing, throw in originals, and then eventually maybe more originals than covers. Mm -hmm. because people recognize it. You know, and it's like, okay. That's, that's, <laughs> that's yeah that's the yeah, i know secret. i know yeah i know we're trying to get people dancing and then play our original music and, and hopefully that keeps them dancing yeah well and I, it's just it's i can see it i mean i would do the same thing well yeah i mean and that's that's kind of the the unofficial long-term strategy it's like yeah we can do these events and um you know events definitely help support the tour fund um, help support writing and recording and mixing, and releasing music, which is expensive. Um, but you know, we're we're getting to a place where our our repertoire of originals is growing, and I feel more confident about it as it's released. Um, uh, then we want to make that a focus as well, more of a focus. So, yeah, we're um, it, it's. Uh, we're sort of, again, being patient with that process um, and introducing people to that music at our shows in, in between, you know, maybe some covers and dance music. Yeah. What did you, you perform with the Glenn Miller Orchestra for a while. How long did, was that, was it less than a year? How long, many, how long did you? Yeah, do no, it was, it was uh, about seven months, um, which we probably, I probably played 200 
shows with them in that time frame, or maybe 160 you play a shows. lot yeah i mean it was it was like every night it felt like we had maybe five gigs a week um and uh so it was yeah it was a lot um my math is probably wrong but um but yeah no man it was it was a lot of living on a bus and super fun and with with good people and you know a lot of times i think back i wish i had stayed on longer um at least a full year i I wish i had stayed on a full year but just life man just like certain you got a calling to do yeah you get a calling to do something else yeah sure yeah i mean i was i was dating a girl and i wasn't making a lot of money on the road or saving money and and it was just you know the girl wasn't she wasn't not in the glenmore orchestra she was um at home at memphis at the time and yeah i just i wanted to be gigging in memphis and teaching and making a little more money so i mean that's I guess that's really what it came down to. My time in the Glen Miller Orchestra, I think very fondly of. I mean, I, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a bad time, you know, for sure. It was. It oh was no, fantastic. I mean, you, it, anybody that knows anything about music, if you get to play in the Glen Miller Orchestra and it's the real Glen Miller Orchestra, first off, you got to be a good player. You can't suck. They don't. Hire yeah, anybody, right. you know. Secondly, when you play, everybody knows what you're going to play. I mean, when you start a song, they all know what it is because they've heard it. And that's right. what makes it feel great, you know, and then, yeah. and, but the other part of it is you're, you're right. Then you're on a tour all the time and then you mm-hmm. forget what town you're in, you know? And, and so do you think that I, I'm just curious on my own level, there's, there's a sense when you write your own music that you're doing your own thing, but when you're doing like a tour with Glenn Miller, you can't break out and do much. It's pretty much the standard. Every night's the same show, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, it, the music—you can't go. Oh, hey, give me, uh, give me some bars here. I want to do a little ad lib here. That's none of that's going to happen. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it was it was like a twenty song set, and ten of the songs we played every night, and ten we would change up. Uh, and then, um, you know, it would be, uh, I guess a healthy amount of you know one or two new songs every couple shows but yeah it it wasn't super open but then again nick hilsher who was the music director he was he was very supportive of of our solos or whatever wanting to step out so there were times you know the encore he he would open something up for you okay Uh, and maybe one song a night you know yeah so going back to your your heritage so to speak your dad was a musician i assume he still is probably plays some uh what what was his what was his instrument what did he play dad my grandfather was a musician oh your grandfather i'm sorry i'm my grandfather was a trumpet player oh okay i thought it was your dad was your grandfather and and a and a guitar player yeah which i thought was my dad it's got a string my dad used to sing uh classic rock to me in the car What, uh, what was it? I'm just curious. What did he listen to a lot? What was his What was his bands he listened to? I mean, Aria. I mean, he just it wasn't stuff that. No, really I know did. everybody listens to different stuff, but I mean, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Do you ever get in a listen- car and go, Dad? I don't want to hear another Led Zeppelin song. A lot of Kansas, but but you know, my dad. Um, he was very supportive of um is very supportive um of of everything i've done with music so he lives in mexico (laughs) we're not super close well no but he where does he live okay i'm not (laughs) gonna ask he lives in Guanajuato. oh i know Uh, where that is that's his famous from shawshake redemption redemption that's where they were going to yeah but but uh very cool guy and uh supported me every step of the way bought me a drum set he made sure i made it to lessons and you know he he was supportive of every single thing i ever did musically and i don't think i would be where i am without that but you know uh not much of a musician himself 
But was your Sorry, grandfather I'm... kind of influenced you on that. And, and watching what you did, you started, you know, it's funny because everybody I talk to in the stringed instrument people, they all start mm -hmm. young. You know, a lot right. of them start on piano. I think the youngest performer I had was four. He said, I think I, I think I started at four. You did kind of the standard elementary when it was like fifth grade or something. We Elementary starts bringing out the horns. Or, and, and what are you going to play now, you know, or sixth grade or whatever it is. That's kind of where you got started, wasn't it? performing i mean you um, learn how to play an instrument was it before that you started playing something yeah i started playing the drum kit when i was eight years old oh your drummer and okay then, i mentioned that yeah well i mean that was my first instrument and then i uh, picked up baritone in middle school band and then trombone in high school so um so yeah i was uh you know i came from uh i was just like beating on desks and stuff in class and <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then middle school band at uh, Edison Middle School here in Tulsa. I started playing baritone and then um, trombone in high school. I had some very influential uh, music teachers that kind of changed my path. Um, but, but then so, yeah. you, you did, you got your master's, but then you, as you said earlier, and I read about this too, you did some teaching. Yeah, no, I'm a teacher. Yeah, I'm currently a teacher. And, and to me that I could never do it. You know, people come to me and say, teach me how to play guitar. And it's like, I don't have the patience for it mm -hmm. because you know, they'd want to play a tune or something like that. And I'd go after a while, I'd go, I, I can't do this, <laughs> but yeah, yours a little different because the fact that you grew up in the, the uh, academic world of performing, getting your sure. degree in music. So, and you obviously can emulate those people that really impressed you and their style of teaching. Mm -hmm. Right. And you also get to see the next generation of people that you go, oh, I know where they're going. You know, and, and I think that's kind of rewarding too, to be able to see that. Totally. Because, you know, I, yes. I, I'm fortunate I get to see people at both ends of their career because I do a lot of independent artists. Some that are starting out that, you know, they're going a long ways and the other ones that are at the end of the, well so at the end of their career so they've been, they've been performing for decades and already famous or whatever so i i guess that'd be the rewarding part about teaching is that you know and then and and then you know one day they're gonna be better than me i know they are <laughs> it's like you know. well like you said who is the gentleman you said was was that who is it the trumpet player was the one you said was outside the norm he was crazy i mean he's that good he's just that phenomenal in your band uh isaac washam I, I think all of our musicians are so talented but yeah isaac's a fantastic trombonist from well uh not originally from denton but he went to unt yeah it's a small world isn't it so what can people yeah. expect all right so let's 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 end with this what can people expect when they come to see the king cabbage brass band um just a good time uh yeah i mean our our mission is to bring joy so if we spread some joy in the room that's we've done our job i can't knock down but i get up again